please give us a welcome for David Mueller of Rum Jungle. David. Thank you very much. I'd just like to thank Tim for uh, putting on this uh, very different venue for me and for everybody coming along to listen to Ram Jungle. I must say that uh, since 1978, Ram Jungle's been the fifth company I've floated and I've only ever given one presentation in the evening. And that was in uh, January 1980 and it was a very memorable occasion. I'd just like to reflect on it so that you can see how times have changed. And I'd been in London for two weeks, being taken around with uh, Casanova Partners to all the investment houses in London. And our stock in this little company, Samantha Exploration, had gone from 80 cents to 90 cents. And this was two weeks. We discovered the Mount Rawdon gold deposit, which is still being mined up in Queensland. And there was a gold boom, which you saw from our last speaker, and uh, this was the middle of January, 1980. Gold had gone through 800 US. And on the last couple of days I was in London, I was asked to get on the Concord and go across and give a presentation in New York. On the Friday night, which was my only ever evening performance. So it was a little group like this, and I was standing up the front with a grand piano, and um, there was a waiter in tails holding up maps and plans. And the guy that introduced me said, now just you guys be careful in here when you've heard this bill. This is a very little company, and uh, if you go out and start buying stock, you'll put it through the roof. And we're all a bit worried about this. Anyway, I gave the spill, and I got on a plane, and I went back to um, Perth to my family and we were on holidays at Rottnest Island in those days you used to turn on the ABC in the morning to listen to AM and then there was a crisp English voice that would give you a, a summary of the world markets the next after the AM show, after the morning show. And that Tuesday morning he came on and he said the gold price has gone up another twenty dollars. He said BHP are up five cents in London and Little Gold Explorer, Samantha Exploration is up a dollar to a dollar ninety on heavy trading on ADRs in New York. Anyway, we listen to this every morning. By the end of the week, the stock was $4.20. <laughs> and it stayed around $3 for a couple of years and eventually got taken over. But um, things have changed a lot since then. So I hope this evening uh, presentation is uh, as effective as that one. <laughs> So just a bit about Rum Jungle. We had discovered a phosphate deposit in uh, the Northern Territory, and we couldn't see that uh, there'd be much sense in having trucks with Rum Jungle uranium carrying phosphate up to the port <laughs> of Darwin, so we changed the name to Rum Jungle Resources. Um, at the moment, our market cap's around 50 to 60 million. It was 60 million when I wrote this, but since we lodged a takeover bid, um, we've weakened down to 22. Um, we've announced uh, Jork Resources on both a potash play and a phosphate play, the only company in Australia that has both assets in Australia. We now have a measured uh, 138 million tonnes of 15.7 P2O5 phosphate rock, which was announced recently and is now the largest measured resource in Australia of phosphate. Um, there is a, a quarter of a billion tonne resource uh, inferred and indicated and measured. We've drilled over 2,000 reverse circulation holes in the deposit for 60,000 metres. A full scoping study is underway, which will be completed, um, it says here in September, but it's going to be March. Uh, in the potash, we have a resource of 5.5 million tonnes of potassium sulphate, which is a premium product. We'll talk about that later. And we've just announced a takeover last month for a neighbour who has... Um, part of the, uh, the western, the eastern side of our deposit. Directors are Rob Annals, who's chairman of um, Lakes Oil, who's just done a great job bringing in Gina Reinhardt. And he was also the director of the chairman of um, uh, the company that had Prominent Hill when they discovered that. Myself, managing director, and Jeff Landles was a former CEO of the uh, Incitec Pivot Phosphate Deposit when it was run by Western Mining. Chris Ciolis is here with me and uh, other staff in Darwin. 
We're proud of our latest shareholders. Washington H sold Patterson's and now bought up to 18.8%. Two uh, Melbourne institutions that are trendsetters in, in mining investment, Lion Selection and Acorn Capital, both holding around 5%, and Far Joy, uh, which is the Robinson family here in Sydney, 6.5%. I'll talk quickly about the Barrow Creek deposit. It's, a, it's quite unique in its geography and geology, are very uh, much in favour of development. The key factors for development are access to the rail and the port via the Darwin uh, port. That opens Asian export opportunities for supply stability to Asian partners rather than depending on the Mediterranean producers. Uh, proximity of the Georgina Basin to the railhead uh, it's a very attractive deposit, high-grade ore, close to the surface. You'll see these in some sections. It's cheap mining, it's blanket uh, uniformity, allows for uh, well-planned extraction, and it could end up being a billion-tonne deposit if we're successful with the takeover. Just quickly looking at the main distribution of phosphate, it's these countries here around North Africa that produce the world's supply. America now is, used to be an exporter, it's not. So all the phosphate has to come through the sewers around here into Asia. China's the largest producer in the world, but is not allowed to export any and it has an embargo on export. Um, if you look at the main countries in uh, the Mediterranean that produce, uh, Syria, Jordan, Egypt, Tunisia, Algeria, Morocco, a lot of instability there. So when you talk to your Chinese partners and Indians and people, you do feel there is concern about uh, longevity of supply from these parts of the world and they're looking for investment opportunities such as in Australia. Again, this uh, slide emphasises the proximity of Darwin Port to the various um, importing countries in India. The rail facility goes right into the port in Darwin. That takes Panamax ships. That's already a bulk overhead loading facility for iron ore and manganese. So uh, Darwin, on the other side of the harbour, the Incitec pivot development's taking place. Darwin is a very go-ahead place. Uh, this slide shows the location of the property here alongside the uh, Central Australian Railway Line, which of course also goes down to Adelaide. This uh, slide indicates the shape of the Georgina Basin, and this is the Northern Territory Queensland border, Queensland over here, Mount Isa, Incitec pivot over here. So the basin is an old Cambrian sea, and that's the old shoreline. Phosphate occurs around the shoreline, that's where it deposited as sedimentary beds. We were the first people to come in and discover this phosphate over on the uh, western side of the basin. People here are restricted with rail supply and uh, access to port. So we had a, a ready-made situation on the western side of the basin to maybe start up an export business into Asia with large tonnage uh, phosphate, railing it up the, the rail line. Deposit's very shallow and uh, it's about six metres thick on average. The red is plus 30% material. And you can see that's only 10 metres deep along there, so stripping ratio is almost one to one. In places, it uh, actually comes to the surface here, and we just got a small excavator in and dug a uh, costine into this, and we wanted to sample the bulk uh, of this 30% material here, which you can actually see in that slide. And this is 28% phosphate on that layer and 32% phosphate there, which is direct shipping grade. It does need to be washed and cleaned up and played around with a bit, so you don't just dig it out and send it straight away. But um, that is worth that sort of material is worth around 180 tons, uh, $180 a ton, loaded in Morocco. So we have an advantage of um, both uh, shipping um, proximity as well as uh, digging proximity. A lot of the mines I've seen in China and everywhere are all underground, so. Um, they're not used to seeing things like this. That's the blanket shape of the material. Um, that's a poster we've just prepared for Mines and Money in Hong Kong next week. But again, there's another costine showing how shallow the ore is. 
no drilling or blasting, and I'll get into these slides on another thing. What the operation may look like because of its blanket shape, I've plagiarised this by taking photos from a helicopter recently over Incitec pivot in Mount Isa. You can see they've got a fair bit of um, overburden here, but that's the flat phosphate bed. There's no drilling and blasting, they're just digging that with an excavator and loading it into trucks and it goes straight up to their plant there where they make diammonium phosphate. They don't export high grade phosphate, they just make DAP. So the 2,000 odd drill holes we drilled in this property, you can get an idea, this is five kilometres by six kilometres. These holes that filled in here gave us the measured resource. This is the shallowest material and uh, we wanted to develop that quickly. We've applied for a mining lease over the whole thing. Our boundary um, ran down here. We knew the phosphate would extend out to the, um, to the eastern side here, and that actually fell in another company's tenement, New Power, which has just changed its name to Central Australian Phosphate. So we announced a takeover. The reason being, We've announced uh, 230 million tonnes in this block. They've announced 300 million in that block, so you've got 550 million tonnes. We've only got two drill holes out here. We stopped drilling there because um, it was getting a bit deep, but then we've subsequently discovered these two holes had shallow phosphate at 15 metres depth and 20 metres depth and we need to extend that out, so there's big potential. We're gonna drill this on one kilometre line spacing, and if we're successful, we'll keep drilling out to the, to the east here. Um, we call ours Barrow Creek 1, which is because of the geographic location. Barrow Creek, which was previously just famous for the Falconio murder and Joanna Lees, <laughs> is over here about 80 kilometres, and these guys have called theirs Arganara, but it is the same deposit. And one thing I learned is you have to be very careful with uh, Aboriginal names. Another company called Julia Mines, and we had a, a big operation, a plant on the side of the road between Menzies and Kalgoorlie, and we had some open pits, and uh, it was right next to Lake Goongarry. Anyway, I had this Aboriginal elder came up to me one day, and um, we had the big sign up saying, um, Julia Mines, Goon Gary Operations. And he came up with this big grin on his face and I could fear there was some trouble coming. He said, do you know what Goon Gary means? And I said, no, I said, I thought it was just the name of the lake. And he said, no, no, he said, it's got a meaning. He said, Gunya, he said, Goon comes from Gunya, which means to excrete. And he said, Gary means in a hurry. And it turns out that they, the Aborigines used to take the Epsom salts off the salt, off the lakes, as a uh, laxative. So I had this terrible name that um, I managed to keep silent until today. <laughs> I asked him if anyone knew about that and he said no. So I said, well, can you keep it quiet? And he actually did. <laughs> so I don't know what we'll do with Arganara. We'll have to do a bit of research there, but if we're lucky, and, we, uh, and this takeover works for us. Um, they closed off the west side of the deposit, the east side of the deposit here, and um, they have indicated that there's quite a lot more ore down here, so that's another 20 kilometres. So between the two of us, it makes sense that we could turn this into a billion tonne deposit. We have a lot more money than they do. We're a lot more advanced in our development. It would make a good merger and we're not building two roads out to the railway line, we're not building two beneficiation plants, um, and we'll just have to see what happens at the end of the day. Um, basically, we also have another deposit down here which has the potential to be several hundred million tonnes of phosphate. It's 80 kilometres further away, but uh, the Barrow Creek uh, Arganara scenario is here and the railway line's only 70, 80 kilometres out here. Uh, the combined tenement holdings, ours are in the purple and um, Central Australian Phosphate are in the red. Basically that's uh, a scenario of the, um, of the phosphate. There'll be a scoping study finished in um, hopefully within three or four weeks. 
The potash is something that's quite um, different. There's been a huge demand in potash around the world. I won't really run into um, why potash is so good, but the Chinese need about 8 million tonnes a year. It all comes out of Canada, basically, um, and it's mined over a kilometre deep. We saw the takeover attempt by BHP of Potash Corporation to try and get control of world potash supplies. But there are other means of producing potash, and worldwide it's produced from Lake Brine by pumping out brine rich in potassium and sulphate and evaporating it in ponds and eventually separating the salt from the um, potash. And that's what we've done here. We have a well-located project on the Lassiter Highway that's the highway from uh, the Stewart Highway, which runs out to um, Ayers Rock. And there's about 120 kilometres of these lake brines in here. Now we've been drilling those over the last two or three years. We've come up with a five and a half million tonne resource of potassium sulphate. Now we would initially target producing three million tonnes of uh, potassium sulphate out of these lakes which isn't as big as the, uh, uh, the phosphate, you'd be talking two million tonnes of phosphate exports. But potash is a much uh, more valuable product and um, it's probably got a lot lower um, capital cost. The only thing we need here, apart from evaporation ponds, are flotation uh, areas. So the Karinga Lakes are down here. Lake Amadius is in here, which would be a magnificent producer, but it's a total sacred site. And then there's Lake Hopkins up here. So it's all part of the same low-lying shear zone between these two um, highland areas over several hundred kilometres. So it's very similar to what happens in uh, Utah, Salt Lake City, and the Atacama Desert, and um, uh, in China at Lake Qinghai. So you need the solar evaporation and you need a potash source. So if you go to your average salt lakes in Western Australia, whatever, they're just internal drainages. Where the, where the water runs in from um, inland creeks and things and evaporates, but it doesn't have that potassium. This water comes through these uh, mountain ranges to the north and to the south and it moves through aquifers high in potassium and it evaporates out and gives us very rich potassium, magnesium and sulphate values. It was a joint venture with Reward Minerals, who you probably aware have Lake Disappointment. They have something like a 20 million tonne um, potash resource, but it's quite isolated, but um, it's certainly the biggest uh, jork resource in Australia at the moment. Uh, we've done extensive brine sampling, bench scale tests, and we've done production, and we're about to do deeper drilling to build the resource up. When we first that went there, we just dug holes around the lakes to sample the various um, brines to prove that there was potassium and magnesium and sulphur. Um, we then brought in, in 2011, we bring these little rigs in, the heli um, copter supported air core and uh, vibra core rigs. They can drill down about two to three metres so that we're able to pump test all the brines from under the surface, knowing that in the end of the day, what you want to do is cut a channel across the lake and pump the brine out. So we're actually, actually able to establish resources doing that. We then went in last year with much bigger rigs and um, we built these mats uh, out on the lake and um, pump tested them and we drilled down to um, into the aquifer here. We were surprised to find that the potash uh, rich brine is not just in the lake sediments which are only three metres thick but they're in the sheared siltstones underneath the lakes and so we pump tested those and got very good results and potentially higher grades. So there's two sources of the potash from the shallow um, trenches and from deeper bores. And the Atacama Desert in, Ch in uh, Chile produces two million tonnes of potash and they pump from as deep as 200 metres in their bores. These are just showing the mats that uh, we did our jork. We, we had hydrologists estimate the jork resource. Um, a photo of Lake Hopkins, which we haven't started exploring yet. It's on Aboriginal land, but we're meeting with the, those people next month, and we expect that will uh, substantially add to resources as well. If you look at the um, process here, we did a process testing here in Sydney with MW 
water and they start off evaporating the uh, brine in tanks in their laboratory and then they get a salt which is about 7% uh, potassium and they build it up to 19% potassium and then they have to separate it and they end up with um, shernite which is potassium magnesium sulfate and down here they also have a byproduct of magnesium sulfate which is called uh, epsonite um, which is what Epsom salts is. Locals call it Goongaryite. So that is, a, that is a valuable product. The mixed salts, um, we produce these salts through the various evaporation uh, and improve the uh, values, as I said. It's in the form of potassium magnesium sulfate. Uh, very simple evaporation tests, various uh, salts produced, removing the halite, the sodium chloride, ending up with an enriched potassium salt. And you can see what happens, uh, these things in China, these are the sort of channels that they put through the lakes to pump out of. They evaporate on a large scale, that's probably 120 hectares. So the first salt that drops out is the sodium chloride. They leave that and then they capture the brine which is naturally enriched in potassium which is the last thing that crystallises. And they mine that and then that goes into the plant where it gets uh, floated and washed off. Another example in Utah of the same process. Some of the insides of the flotation facilities, they just uh, add a soap and they bubble the uh, material and the bubbles catch the potassium and remove it away from the sodium. In the Atacama Desert, they even use liners in their tanks and uh, they start producing the salt and it's the same process worldwide. So it's a major uh, alternate way of producing potassium without having to go a um, thousand metres underground and spend four billion dollars trying to develop a project. Just an aerial shot of um, some of the evaporation ponds in Chile. Uh, so what we have to do now is get approval for trenching across the lakes so that we can pump test them for several days, build some evaporation ponds, drill these deeper holes to 50 metres to try and double the brine resource, and um, more process route testing, commence exploration at Lake Hopkins. If this all happens, we can start a scoping study uh, towards the end of the year. So that'll give us two advanced fertiliser projects for Rum Jungle. You put your hands together and thank David Miller for coming across the big paddock. <laughs>